Welcome to Politicus, the only podcast that discusses politics and public service from the Portuguese American perspective. Here we discuss everything from federal policy, local issues, and U.S. Portugal relations with the goal of driving more discussion and awareness of the issues affecting our nation, our community, and what we as Portuguese Americans can do about it. And now, Politicus. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Politicus. My name is Angela Simos, and I'm here with Denise Borges. How's it going, Denise? Fantastic. How are you? I'm doing well. We, if our listeners have been listening consistently, they may notice that we sound better today because we have some new fancy schmancy uh, equipment we're using to, you know, make sure that we're professional and doing this the right way. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who have been listening, we'd love your feedback. Do we sound better? I don't know. Maybe it'll make a make us sound like we know what we're doing. Anyway, so we have today as our guest Lee Nevs or Nevis. Oh no, Lee, you could tell us how you pronounce your. Either, <laughs> you know, I'm not. I'm not picking. <laughs> okay. Everyone is good. And Lee is. Uh, we've never had someone who does what you do, and you are essentially a campaign consultant. Correct. Yes. Uh, yeah. P- uh, political consulting, governmental relations, all that, all that fun stuff. As, as I like to say, I'm I'm the guy behind the guy. Right. Okay. Right. And you know, one of the reasons we are having Lee on is because the point of this podcast is to explore all the different ways that people can get involved in the political process and public service. And so it's not just running for office. And Lee can actually give us some behind the, th- the scenes glimpse, you know, as you say, the, the guy behind the guy, what really happens and how, what do campaigns look like and things like that. So I, I think um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I think it's going to be pretty interesting. So welcome, Lee. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's just jump right in and tell us, how did you get into this line of work? How, were you always interested in, in politics? Uh, what, what was your path? You know, I, I was always a little political geek, and I mean, I would, you know, I would, I would come home after school, and and there would be two shows I would watch right away. One was Sports Center, the other was Crossfire on CNN. I mean, that's, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's all I watched. I mean, it, it was I was just fascinated by it, and you know, growing up in a in a very conservative part of California and a conservative little town in Hillmar, you you know, kind of skew to the right, just because of your kind of upbringing and, and who, and your environment and whatnot. Um, But I mean, I just, I was always really, really into it. Started volunteering as, as soon as I could. Uh, 92 was the the first election that the, the first rally I ever went to um, in 1988 when George Bush senior was running for president and he was in Atwater. He came into not Atwater, Merced. He came to Merced, the old county courthouse down in Merced. And uh, one of my best friends, the uh, the Wall Tower brothers, uh, literally lived like two doors away from me. Their dad was one of the deputy sheriffs who was like in charge of security that day. So they literally got us right up to the front row. And I just thought it was amazing. I, you know, here's this guy, he's vice president of the United States, probably going to be the next president. And, you know, here I am, you know, I can just like feet away from the guy. I just thought it was fantastic. And, you know, hooked ever since, you know, started volunteering in in 1992 and, and kind of, kind of went on, went on from there. Did my undergrad up at uh, the University of the Pacific in Stockton, went to law school at their law school, McGeorge School of Law in Sacramento, started working Mm -hmm. in state capital and the rest is history, as they say. Lee, what was your first political uh, job, not just as a volunteer, but as a, uh, a paid political consultant? Them, them actually paying me? Um, <laughs> it was, uh, I, I, I paying you for something you like to do, yes. I, I know, I know. I'm heartbroken. I have to do that. Um, but uh, it was, I was in the office of then assistant Republican leader of the state assembly, a gentleman named Keith Olberg who was uh, from San Bernardino County, the San Bernardino High Desert area. And I was his, first I just started interning, you know, literally just, you know, will work for food um, <laughs> after, after my first year of, of law school. And then he brought me on to a paid position. And, you know, being the assistant Republican leader is uh, you, you kind of get, you know, access to, to knowing people that help you out in the business and, and kind of help you move along. And so that was my first actual, you know, real political slash legislative job. 
And uh, from there, you've been basically you have ran a couple of campaigns, correct? Yeah, yeah. I uh, the first campaign I ran, I was political director for then State Senator Dick Monteith when when he ran against Dennis Cardoza. I know blasphemy. I oh working, my gosh! I was <laughs> on the other side. Oh, but I know horrible, horrible. I got Cassie. I, 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 here, then again, you're talking to a guy who was rooting for the United States when they played Portugal in the 2002 World Cup. So I mean, they just oh, yeah, they that's me, a tough one. They call me traitor. Yeah. Um, but uh, that was my the actual campaign actually running. That was my first one, and it was a great experience. You know, granted, it was a very unique campaign because the whole Gary Condit scandal and mm-hmm. and whatnot. Um, so being in that high profile of a campaign that had national attention was definitely a unique experience and and just helped me you know grow from there and you know you came up obviously came up on the short end of the stick but um it was a fun campaign and and i made lifelong friends from it and you were also involved uh, i believe running or or very heavily involved in running the johnny Teixeira against uh, jim costa correctly yes yes the, uh, the the time we had a congressman for half a week he literally was a congressman for half a week. <laughs> that was a, uh, the first time that we have a uh, that we kind of know uh, we don't have the best uh, records on political stuff of Portuguese Americans. There is a book uh, published, uh, and Flad has actually paid for it a few years ago. But uh, we don't have a whole bunch of history as we should, and, and uh, hopefully it'll be all collected someday. But that we know of, that's the first time two Portuguese Americans ran against each other for Congress. Yeah, I think that was the first Portuguese versus Portuguese race. And it was it was it was definitely an interesting race, you know, in the fact that it we were outspent by the congressman ten to one. And mm-hmm. and no one really gave us a snowball's chance of of even being competitive. There were two congressmen who helped us out. Uh one was Devin Noons. He he helped us out there near the very end. Um, and Kevin McCarthy also helped us out at the very end when it looked like we might actually have a shot at this thing. Um, and, you know, we were polling and, and, and we were very focused on how to use the money that we did have and the messaging we had. And, and, and one thing it's one thing you find out, especially during a race like that is that, I mean, a lot of times, a lot of people automatically think identity politics, just because you're, you know, Portuguese or whatnot, you're going to vote for that person. Um, there are a lot of issues that cut across that, you know, people that normally would have been Costa uh, supporters came over to Johnny. And, mm. you know, obviously it was, it was an off year election. It was, you know, 2014. So the, the, the voter profile skewed more in, and the funny thing about politics and, and campaigns is in non-presidential years, the voter profile usually, generally, not always, but usually skews more to the right just because of who comes out to vote. And when it's a presidential year, it skews more to the left. So we had that in our favor. But I mean, it was it was interesting getting written up by the Wall Street Journal and the National Review and and kind of being like the talk of the political world there for about a week while we were ahead by 700 and like 31 votes. Um, So it was, that definitely was a, it was a great campaign. We had a great time and, you know, did the best we could and and almost pulled off a miracle, you could say. And so, you know, you mentioned identity politics. I'm just curious. So it's the first time we've had two Portuguese running against each other for, you know, Congress high position, not, not a local position. So what, you know, I guess campaigning within heavily Portuguese populated areas, did you do anything different? Uh, what, you know, did the Portuguese community come out, you know, did they show up to vote and support oh, their well, own? They, yeah, they, they definitely came out to vote. You know, if you look at the, the um, turnout models in a lot of very heavy Portuguese areas, namely Hilmar, Los Banos, Gastin, Dos Palace, which has a heavy Portuguese presence down there. Um, the the turnout models were were higher than most rest of the district and and they really skewed towards us one thing we did is is we advertised heavily on portuguese radio Mm -hmm. Um, and it it wasn't so much you know talking about issues it was just talking about you know johnny's background and the one thing that we had an advantage especially given that year but you you know uh congressman costa you know with He'd been in office in one form or another for 30 years. And, and that, for any 
for any for anyone in office that becomes a liability after a while. Um, and and so we kind of played on the you know Johnny Tashera is one of us, and you know talked about his background and and a little about what he wants to do. You know back in Washington, not really getting into you know very divisive issues, but you know, basically just saying, Hey, he wants to go back there to make things just, just a little easier for you. Um, and that's kind of what we focused on, on the Portuguese radio aspect of it. Um, really selling his profile, his story and, and kind of like, this is a guy who's going to go back there to DC and fight for you. Cause you know, he's been living out here with you guys for his whole entire adult life. Now from a, from a perspective of uh, a political campaign and, you know, running these political campaigns, so. Do you feel that the person running the campaign, obviously uh, the candidates out front, but uh, most uh, and min much of the work in preparing all this is done behind. So how, how, do, how do you play into that? I mean, how does that, uh, uh, besides being very hard work, I can only imagine for quite a few months, how does one get involved uh, if there are any young people, for example, that are listening to us? Um, and that's one of our major uh, concerns is getting more and more young people involved. You in know, it's, it's start, it, I, what I would do is, and, and this is how I, you know, this is kind of how I started, you know, when I was interning, especially up in state capital, is A, don't be afraid to do whatever needs to be done. You know, my first day interning, For some of an old berg, I, I went and got his dry cleaning. And there was no shame in that whatsoever. Walked down the dry cleaners, got it, brought it back. But, you know, be willing to do whatever needs to be done um, and, and ask a lot of questions. And, and that's the one thing that I've been very lucky. You know, a lot of my political mentors encouraged me to ask questions. You know, mm -hmm. when, when they're like, okay, we're going to do this. I'm like, well, why? You know, I, I don't, you know, I think it should be done this way. Why are you doing it that way? And then they explain it. And then you're like, okay, that makes sense. Or, you know, they hear a different perspective from you and they're like, you know what, you got a point. Maybe we will try it your way. But it, it's, it's really, you know, getting your foot in the door and asking, you know, asking a lot of questions. You know, why are we spending so much on TV here instead of here? Why aren't we sending out mail? all this, just really, you know, asking the question to kind of get the insight so that when that opening does come, you, you have a semblance of knowing what, at least the strategy behind the things. And then, you know, obviously each race is different, but if you have that ground, that, you know, foundation and that framework of, of saying, okay, this is, you know, this is what we're going to do. And the timing of it and all that, then, then you should be good to go. Yeah. I was going to expand on that question a bit because I think when people think of, they have a misconception of, well, somebody who runs a campaign, all they, all they do is spin the story and arrange photo ops for politicians to kiss babies. Right. So can you go into a little bit more depth on, you know, what it is that you do as a campaign manager? So you were talking about, you know, decisions on whether or not to do a mailer or where to, where to, you know, what cities to visit or, you know, well, where to advertise, things like that. What are some of the other things that, you know, because if somebody's interested in getting involved in doing this kind of work? The, the first thing we do is get him to the nearest nursery and kiss as many babies as we can. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, it, it, a lot of it, you, you have to evaluate, A, the district you're running in and your candidate's strengths and weaknesses, especially on the issues. So... I'll give you a perfect example. Let's take, let's take the twin tunnels that, that Jerry Brown wants to build. Now, if you are running a uh, campaign in San Joaquin County, which is where I'm at, and they are vehemently opposed to it, then that's an issue you're going to focus on. And you're able to, especially in this day of, of social media and Facebook, you actually literally can go in and, you know, target, let's do, let's say I'm doing a Facebook ad, target people whose interests are the twin tunnels or water um, or water policy. And if they're in San Joaquin and they're interested in water, water policy, then they're, you know, nine and a half times out of 10 going to be against the tunnels. Now take that same issue. If we're in West Fresno, West Fresno County, and we're hitting up people who are, interested in, you know, their Facebook profile says they're interested in water, water policy or whatnot, then we're going to say we love the Twin Tunnels um, because
because that's you know popular down there because that's going to be delivering the water. Um, so you, you have to take into account a where your candidate stands on the issues um, and and where where you're running at. And, mm-hmm. and also the timing of, OK, you know, we've got absentee mailers coming out 29 days before the election. Well, rule of thumb, if someone gets their absentee ballot and fills it out right away, you already know they already know who they're voting for. So you trying to send them a piece of mail or a phone call, not going to work. Usually those hit you know, three to five days after the absentee mail goes out, because then you're hitting the people who are maybe still a little undecided. Um, so that's the kind of timing that goes into it. You know, when we pl- when we run ads on cable TV, I mean, I, I literally go through that with a fine tooth comb and it gets down to where I'm like, OK, let's see. ESPN has Florida and Florida State playing. ESPN2 has Montana and Idaho state. No one is going to care about Montana and Idaho state. So we're not going to advertise on that time frame on that channel, but Florida, Florida state, everyone's going to be watching. So plop, we're going to put a, uh, you know, we're going to put a TV ad on during that time. And, and that's how kind of detailed it gets. You literally, you know, go through and say, you know, what are, you know, what's going to get the big spank for our buck. It, it's funny. A lot of people, they, when we buy our ads, it's it's based on it's not only based on the amount of viewers, but also the demographic of that channel. So while a lot of people may watch MTV, those you know normally if you're watching MTV, you're either a too young to vote or b and this is once again general rule not that engaged. Now if you're watching Home and Garden Network, then you're definitely of age to vote and you're someone who's probably going to be really engaged. So the, um, so the price per ad on the home and garden, home and garden TV is going to be way more than on MTV. And you're going to want to spend more on home and garden TV because that's the audience that you want to hit. So it's a lot of, uh, I hate to use the word, but it's a lot of profiling. Yeah, well, it is. It's, it's very much voter profiling. It mm-hmm. is voter profiling and knowing what voters you want to hit with what issues. Um, if you're, if we're running someone in a Republican primary, we are not going to really advertise on CNN and MSNBC that much. We're going to advertise like crazy on Fox, but you know, I, I don't know how many how many Republicans these days watch CNN and MSNBC. Now, mm-hmm. if we're in a Democratic primary then yeah, we're totally going to advertise on CNN and we're like going to do literally nothing on Fox because of the voter profile of, of who we're trying to target. Sure. When it comes to the Portuguese community, in your experience, what are some of the hot button issues that they seem to care about? Or does it really depend on the area? Um, it, it, I'll just use the, the area that I'm used to and being the Central Valley. A lot of it is you know, overregulation, especially given the fact that, you know, they are in some way, shape or form connected to the farm, agriculture and dairy industry. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something that is, is a major concern to them. The overregulation, you know, EPA coming out and saying it rained and there's a puddle on your on your farm, on your field. So you can't, you know, you can't disc it, you know, for six months, you know, something mm-hmm. along those lines. That that is really really a big concern that strikes the heart of, of their livelihood. Also, education, especially for um, people like and, and I'll, I will use my parents as an example. I mean, my parents got you know married married in Thursada, came over here, had my brother, me, and my sister, and, and to them, education is a big thing because that's why they came here. They came here for us to be able to go to you know get a high school degree and go on to college and whatnot. So a lot of the older uh, Portuguese generation, you can talk to them about education and the fact that, you know, we need to be able to, to have it and, and make it accessible to your kids and your grandkids. That's something that will also, you know, strike home with them as well. This is a twofold question. First of all, when you came home, you said you were uh, watching Crossfire as a very young age, did you have any political influences as far as, you know, uh, with your family, even though they came from their city, were they politically motivated or was it something that you took on yourself first? And second of all, when does the p- political operative in this case, when does the political director become a candidate? 
Um, in, uh, <laughs> I will tackle that one. Uh, I'll tackle the first question first. Um, you know, definitely my mom and, and, and I will encapsulate it. I, I will encapsulate her, you know, kind of political influence in me in one story. So it's 1992, Clinton, Perot and Bush are, are debating and, and my dad is, is sitting there and, and, and watching it and, and the whole abortion issue came up. And so, you know, my dad always a little bit of an independent streak, you know, Clinton said, you know, she have, a woman should have a right to choose so on and so forth. And he's like, yeah, that's right. Uh, my mother jumped on him so fast. I mean, just literally jumped on him. I think he slept on the couch that night. <laughs> that was just the wrong answer. Um, so my, you know, in my family, my mother definitely, uh, skews right. Um, my, my aunt Joyce, God bless her heart, but this is, you know, she is someone who will, who will share, uh, Facebook posts from a Facebook page called Donald Trump, God's choice. Oh, God. I will tell her, I'm like, aunt Joyce, love you to death. You know, I'm very Republican, but I don't think God was up there saying Donald Trump needs to be president. I'm just saying, I, I think he has more important things like, I don't know, world hunger to deal with. I'm just going out <laughs> on that one. Um, those are my, you know, family influences. My brother's a police officer. He definitely tends to skew, skew more right. Um, as far as when, you know, when you decide to make the jump, uh, it, you know, it, it all, it's, it's a very tricky, it, it's a, it, it's, it's a very tricky equation. I'll just use my example. So I had run, I had run Dick Monteith's congressional campaign. I served as year for a, a chief of staff for a, um, state legislator out of Fresno, but I was still living in Hillmar and, you know, I decided, Hey, I'm going to run for County supervisor. Um, against a two-term incumbent who was pretty, you know, she, she was, she was pretty vulnerable, but she's still a two-term incumbent. And it was, you know, a race that combined, and mind you, this is North Merced County at the time. So I think there was a max of 17,700 voters and we combined to spend roughly $150,000. And, and it was just thermonuclear destruction between the two of us. I mean, it just, I don't think there was a positive piece of mail that went out. It was just, I was on the attack. She was on the attack. I lost, I was 28 and I could tell you it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Cause, cause up until then, I mean, I just had this big head. Look at me. I'm Lee. I have my law degree. Look at all these senators and assembly members who are backing me. And, you know, I, I did get a lot of port, a lot of support from, from uh, a lot of Portuguese farmers and dairymen, but I just, I, I needed a little, I needed a little spoon of humility and a spoonful of humility and, and I was given it. So I definitely was too young at that time, but I think it all depends on, on your maturity level and how comfortable you feel in the, in, in the locality you're in, you know, perfect example up here in Stockton, our mayor is 26 years old and I can't think of anyone who's better suited to be the mayor in Stockton at, at, as this time then, Michael Tubbs. I mean, he's doing a great job. Um, he has a great story, but he's definitely mature beyond his years. So, it, but it's all about building that base of support, networking, making the connections so that when you are ready to jump, you can say, hey, I'm going to run. Can I have your support? And, and people aren't going to be like, who are you? They're going to be like, yeah, we're on board. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a great point. Do you think you'll ever run again? No, 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 because I you call me a little old fashioned, but I, I promised I, I promised my parents that because they were very concerned. They're like, Lee, you're 28, you know, why don't you just take a little more time? And I'm like, you know, me being stubborn. Um, no, 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 I'm gonna do it. <laughs> so I, I, I promised them that after this election, after that election, the only campaign I would run would be for re-election or higher office. So, you know, especially to my parents, I'm one who tends to keep his promises. So I, uh, that and that, and I'm sure an ex-girlfriend or two might come out and say something. Um, <laughs> he, he, made, he made me watch football all weekend long. <laughs> but uh, so, so it, it was, it was my one try. And like I said, good experience. Glad I did it. Definitely needed it, needed the loss, 
and uh, I wouldn't change a thing. Well, we are we are at the hour or the half an hour. Or we're at our time, so just wanted to close with uh, one more call to action, if you will. If you could uh, give advice to whether it's that young person or young people out there who are sort of interested in politics, not sure what their path should be, um, how would they start to find their way down a path and get started somewhere? What would you, what would you, you know, suggest? Just, just, just get involved. Just get involved. And, and it could be with your local city council person, county supervisor. It could be on school board. You know, it could be working for a state assembly member or state senator or congressman, but just, you know, get involved. And especially if you're very passionate about an issue, get involved. And the one thing I would also caution, especially given today's environment, the other side is, is not is not the enemy. The other side is not pure evil. If there's one thing I've always taken into and that I learned, especially at an early age in in when I was working in the state assembly, look, the, the other side, you may not agree with the other side of the aisle. You may not agree with how they're doing things, but at the end of the day, both sides just want to make California or the United States or not a better place to live, you know, have different ways of going about it. But, you know, I think if we treat people with more civility and less hostility, you'd be surprised how much more we can get done. So mm-hmm. definitely, you know, definitely for the younger generation, just to, to keep that in mind. And, you know, like I said, get involved. If your passion is education, get involved with the local school board. You know, attend those meetings, you know, ask those tough questions. Don't be afraid to ask tough questions of your local electeds. Um, if you don't agree with what they're doing, you know, don't yell at them and say you're wrong and you're trying to do this and that. Just say, hey, I don't agree with you. Why are you voting this way or, or why, are you, why are you in support of this? I- explain to me why. So I can better understand. I may still disagree with you at the end of the day, but you're going to not only that is, you know, the more civil you are, the more chance you have to influence someone on the other side. Because if you're calling me a name, I'm not going to listen to you. But if you're sitting down and having a conversation with me and being civil about it, you might bring up some good points. And I could say, you know what, you're absolutely 100 percent correct. Correct. If I can just uh, add two little bits. As to uh, when Lee said the other side is not pure evil, it reminds me of uh, an anecdote from uh, a famous Winston Churchill, who at one time was uh, talking about some policy change in the UK. And one of his ministers said, uh, but Mr. Prime Minister, they are our enemies, talking about the opposite party. And he says, no, 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 they're our adversaries. Our enemies are within our own party. Oh, that's interesting. That's a- Sometimes we have to take that yeah. into perspective as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. But but the, the point you make, Lee, about having a civil conversation, I think we need so much more of that. So I'm glad you brought that up. And I think you're absolutely right. Absolutely. So, well, and we with that, we've reached our time. Again, thanks, Lee, for joining us. We really appreciate your perspective and your time. And for those of you out there who maybe not want to run for office, you know, could maybe consider becoming the man behind the man or the gal behind the the candidate, I'm sure Lee would be happy to answer some questions <laughs> if you had Absolutely. any. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm an easy guy to get a hold of. I'm all over Facebook, as you guys know. Yeah, we'll include your website in the show notes. Uh, Cross yeah, Currents, absolutely. Cross Currents uh, is the name of your consulting firm. Yeah. So with that, thanks again. Thank you, Danish, as always. Thank thanks, everybody out there for listening. Really appreciate your time and, you, and having you join us um, with each episode. If you haven't hit subscribe, please do so now. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes or SoundCloud or Stitcher. And please share this podcast with friends and family and colleagues and anyone that uh, you feel could benefit from just hearing some different perspective and, and helps us all get, get more involved. So with that, thanks, everybody. And until next time, have a great day. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Politicus, the official podcast of Palcus, the Portuguese American Leadership Council of the United States. Palcus is the premier national organization representing the interests of the Portuguese American community at large. To learn more about Palcus and how to become a member or to make a donation, visit www.palcus.org. To submit feedback or suggestions about the podcast, email us at palcus at palcus.org. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests of the show are not endorsed by Palcus.